unable to sleep, Fall reaches for the crystal resting on the nightstand beside his bed. Cool to the touch, it shimmers softly under the dim light, a sleek piece of technology crafted for convenience, his universal remote for the quarters. He lightly rotates the gold ring encircling its side, activating notifications on the flat screen monitor embedded in the wall across from him. With a steadying breath, he shifts the setting from to not disturb, to open for business, bracing himself as he checks messages from the others. Most notifications are mundane, requests for supplies, schedules for upcoming meetings, even a couple of idle messages from colleagues trying to lighten the long shifts. But one troubling reminder pierces through the mundane noise. Ninenshu still hasn't reported in, she has been in Comunicado since her recent incursion into a region ominously known as the Dimlands. It gnaws at him, a bitter reminder that she had disregarded the council of the order to which Fall is a member. A mix of worry and frustration tightens in his chest. What had driven her to take such a reckless risk? He can't shake the feeling that something has gone terribly wrong. All right, I know you're itching to learn more about Fall's people and this elusive order I just mentioned. Sweeten your curiosity with a quick bite, an apple slice, if you will, before we return to Fall's tale. Without drowning in too many intricacies, let's just say that Fall is part of a, a group which I will call an order. And this order is nestled within a larger society of like-minded individuals. Both groups share the noble mission of safeguarding our realm from the intrusion of dark forces. They are a community dedicated to this greater purpose, and they are free from the trivialities of bureaucratic red tape. Now about Nin and Shu, she exists outside the order, but within the wider society, and she was explicitly warned of the dangers besetting her actions. The council made it clear that if trouble arose, their support would not extend to her. However it seems, trouble has indeed found her as she hasn't made contact since her incursion into the Dimlands, raising alarm among both the society and the order, most notably in Fall's heart. Fall's thoughts spiral around Nin and Shu and the perils she might be facing wherever she is. She's a peculiar pixie-like figure with delicate wings of gossamer shimmering in the light captivating and elusive. They met while assisting Trantis Terra Custos, a man the Order recently aided during a mission in the northern reaches of the Dimlands. After that harrowing ordeal, Fall had the privilege of escorting her back to her home in the southern Dimlands. They spent precious moments together in that enchanting place before he returned to the tower, the bittersweet memory of her laughter echoing in his mind. Fall struggles to grasp the fragments of his past, hindered by his defective memory. He has endured the trauma of memory-wiping procedures so many times that his recollections are a tangled web of shadows, especially regarding events before his time with the Order. Even now he suffers occasional lapses that leave him grappling with empty spaces where memory should reside. Yet when he thinks of Nin and Shu, a few clear moments surface. He recalls her speaking passionately about a scouting mission in the treacherous northern region, a determination glowing in her eyes. That vibrant image is the last thing he can conjure up fully. Now, with her absence echoing in the silence, he is painfully aware that she sought counsel from his order before venturing into danger, and this has heightened concern among everyone. Even so, Windy, the second in command of the tower, has commanded all personnel to stand down, insisting they await word from the professor or someone in the higher echelons of the order. Fall feels a growing weight of frustration pressing down on him. Someone ought to look for her, he thinks bitterly. She could easily have been captured by the insidious forces of the rogue queen, the Averys, the most formidable adversary the society and the order face in the Dimlands. Someone ought to do something, he laments. The 
plea echoing through his mind like a silent scream. In this moment of turmoil, Fall finds himself torn between desire and duty. He adjusts the crystal, activating the monitor to watch an old spy movie. A nostalgic escape filled with secret agents and heroic military men battling in a world far removed from his own. The thrilling scenes unfold, but after a short time, the allure fades. He turns off the movie abruptly, the flickering screen a stark reminder of the bravery he yearns to embody, but feels powerless to pursue in reality. I know how this one ends, he murmurs, placing the crystal back on its little resting dish. I know how they all end, he adds with a heavy sigh, the words hanging in the stillness. Fall understands the men in those movies all too well. They share a common thread, one that resonates deeply within him. They are restless. He speaks aloud to the empty room, echoing the turmoil, gnawing at his own heart. He yearns to feel alive, to break free from the confines of his own existence. If a man gets too restless, Teddy, he ends up doing something just to feel the pain, right? Just to know he's still alive. This is how Fall interprets the secret agents, those enigmatic figures charging through chaos. I could be like that, Teddy, he says, determination igniting in his voice. There's so much here, tools, resources that could give me an edge, just like those men have. That's all I need, an edge and the chance to use it. Unable to endure the taunting gaze of the dark mirror any longer, he climbs out of bed and strides to the full-length mirror, scrutinizing the image reflecting back at him. The surface glints ominously, an unwilling witness to his conflict. We can be more, he tells himself, his voice low but fierce. We are more. In those words, he senses the flicker of potential, a spark igniting his resolve as he contemplates the possibilities waiting beyond the tower's walls. He leans against the mirror, a weary sigh escaping his lips before pushing himself away from its reflective surface. Who are you? He asked the man with the outstretched arm before him. Fall something, wasn't it? A wry smile crosses his face at the absurdity of it all. Turning to consider his silent companion, he continues, I don't know who I was, Teddy, but I damn sure know who I am now and what I deserve. I feel something for her, he muses, a flicker of hope mingling with uncertainty. I wonder if she could be someone significant, someone I knew not just from that last mission, but maybe from long ago, right? He gazes back into the full-length mirror, his voice laden with longing. From another place, another time, once upon a time, they don't understand what I'm going through, Teddy. None of them do. It's so lonely. I look at someone, and I can't tell if they're just a stranger or a passing acquaintance. Or maybe, just maybe, something more. For a moment he holds the man's gaze in the mirror, pondering his own fragmented identity. With a deep breath, he steps toward the door, unlocking it and gripping the cool metal handle firmly. I'll be back soon, Teddy. I gotta work. As the door to Falls Quarters closes behind him, we catch a glimpse of a legal-sized yellow sheet of paper settling against the inside of the door. It has rustled each time Fall walked by, or opened and shut the door. The paper is fixed at the top, with a small magnet in the shape of a yellow lightning bolt. Handwritten in pencil on the paper is a simple yet profound message. Knowing is not enough, we must apply. Willing is not enough, we must do. Goethe.